Thanks for coming this morning. My name is Bob Stiegel, and I'm here to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is fancy pointers. And in order to convince the program committee that this talk was worthy, I added for fun and profit <laughs> so that the capitalist motive in everyone would be satisfied. Uh, I also think of this as stupid allocator tricks. Now, uh, at the reception, John was handing out these bands for East Const and West Const, and I will tell everybody here that this talk is unabashedly East Const. Yeah. And it's actually, <laughs> it's actually sponsored by the American East Const Association of America. <laughs> so you can thank them for this. All right. So I think the, the best way to think about and understand uh, fancy pointers is to think about them in the term, in, in the context of a motivating problem, which I'm going to discuss briefly. I'm going to talk about the way I view the ideas of addressing and allocation, which may not be the right way, but it's my way. We're going to spend a fair amount of time looking at a, a framework around fancy pointers and implementation. I'm going to talk about something I call, uh, also going to take a, a quick detour for a few minutes to address problems of performance. I've got a few benchmarks that I've run. I want to share that data with you so you can have an understanding of what the, the runtime costs are of using a fancy pointers. At the end, uh, I'm going to, hopefully, uh, the stars will align and the physical constants of the universe will not have changed and uh, do a couple of quick demos for you of two different kinds of relocatable heaps and the problems that they could potentially solve. And then uh, have the obligatory two or three bullets at the end of summary. So let's think about the motivating problem. That, to me, is the problem of persistence. Uh, and I think of two kinds of persistence, really, sort of static or traditional persistence, whereas you write something to a persistent media and you forget about it and you load it back in from that media at some point in the future, like a file, right? Or dynamic persistence where you create, uh, you, you do the same operations that you would do for static persistence, but you put things in a buffer because you're going to send it to somebody else and they're going to use the contents of that buffer without actually having gone through a traditional uh, storage medium. So suppose I have a set of types or objects uh, these objects potentially have container members. Uh, and these container members could be nested, containers of containers. I have some complex object. Maybe I have a large number of these objects, gigabytes. Uh, maybe these objects have time-consuming uh, construction, copy, or traversal operations. And traversal is important here. And what I'd really like to be able to do is to save this to a traditional persistent storage medium, like a file, or send it somewhere else. How can I accomplish these feats in general? How do you do this in general, right? Well, the obvious solution, the one that computer scientists have been doing for 50 years or more, is serialization. Step one, in some way, in some fashion, you iterate over this set of source objects and you serialize them into some intermediate format. Now, this intermediate format could be JSON, which is very popular these days. It could be YAML or XML or protocol buffers or some other proprietary format, right? But it is an intermediate representation of your original set of objects. The purpose of this, well, it's obvious, right? The purpose is to save the important object state. Step two, some point in the future, deserialize the information contained in the intermediate format into some corresponding set of destination objects. Our purpose, again, it's very obvious. We want to recover that important object state. So the important object state is that state which fulfills this post condition. And the post condition is each, each destination object in the destination process, which is not necessarily the source process, must be semantically identical to its corresponding source object. 
Now, what does semantically identical mean? That depends on you. I'm not going to try and define that. But in each problem, semantically identical will have some meaning specific to that problem. And I'm going to leave it at that. Sort of like uh, the edge foam that Lisa talked about yesterday morning. It's, you know, you could go down very deeply trying to solve this problem. I think of this approach as traversal-based serialization. Traversal, because to do the serialization, I have to, in some fashion, traverse the set of source objects to create the intermediate format. So let's talk for a moment about the intermediate format. The intermediate format provides what I think of as forms of independence. One form that I think of is architectural independence. In other words, an intermediate format can free me from the mundane details of byte ordering, class member layout, address space layout, the hardware I'm running on. Think of something like JSON, right? JSON frees you from those considerations. It can also provide you, in a sense, a kind of representational independence. Intra-language independence, where a list of vector of char could be considered semantically identical to a list of string. Or inter-language independence, where a Java list of string is semantically identical to a C++ list of string. And finally, most importantly for this talk, is the concept, the idea that I think of as positional independence. And positional independence means that important state is preserved when the destination objects exist at a, different, at a potentially different address in a potentially different process. So I've got source objects A, B, C in process 1, and I have somehow moved them into process 2 where they become destination objects X, Y, Z, and they are correspondingly semantically identical. Well, you know, we've all been down this road. We all know that there are costs associated with this kind of serialization. In C++, we don't have reflection yet, so per type code has to be written or generated. You have to traverse the source objects and render them to the intermediate format. You have to parse the intermediate format to reconstruct your destination objects. And we all know that this kind of code can be complex and fragile. If your object layout changes, the code to do the work also has to change. There's a temporal cost because the entire stream has to be read end to end. Uh, it, I suppose it's possible in may, maybe formats that permit some sort of parallelization of this, but streaming by its very nature is a linear thing. There's a spatial cost. Uh, many intermediate formats are verbose. Think of XML. It's incredibly verbose. Uh, some intermediate formats could allow private implementation details to be exposed, information that you don't want other people to see. And it could, it could provide a way for encapsulation of your objects to be violated. So let's revise the problem statement a little bit. Suppose that I don't need architectural representational independence. Suppose my source and destination platforms are the same. My class member layout is the same on, on both platforms. And I can use the same actual object code on both platforms. Can I implement object persistence that doesn't require any sort of per-type serialization or deserialization code that allows me to persist standard containers and strings and allows me to use fast binary I.O. like write and read or send and receive? Well, my idea for solving this is what I call a relocatable heap. And a, a, I define a relocatable heap as being relocatable if it can be serialized and deserialized with simple binary I.O. like memcopy and after deserialization at a different address in a possibly different process, the heap continues to function correctly and the heap's contents continue to function correctly. All right, well, how is this possible? Well, I'm going to recurse down one level and, and declare that Every object in a relocatable heap must be of a relocatable type. So, what is a relocatable type? A type is relocatable if it is serializable by writing raw bytes and is deserializable by reading raw bytes. And a destination object of that type is semantically identical to its corresponding source object regardless of the destination process and its address in the destination process. In a way, 
and I'm abusing the language here, a relocatable type is in a sense context-free. What kind of types are relocatable? <laughs> Integers, floating point types, standard layout, or the old-fashioned term is pod type that contains only integer and floating point types or other standard layout types. In other words, the whole thing is standard layout if you have nested structures. What kind of types are not relocatable? Well, ordinary pointers to data are not relocatable because if things move to a different process space, the data to which the pointer refers to may exist at a different address and the pointer is no longer valid. Pointers to member functions, static member functions, free functions, they're not relocatable because reference to object code may very well exist at a different address in a different process. Types with virtual functions are not relocatable because the vtables will likely exist at a different address. Types or values of relocatable types that express, express <coughs> some kind of process dependence, like a file descriptor, which is an int, or a Windows handle, which is an unsigned int, by definition, process-dependent handle types are meaningless outside their own process, and therefore they're not relocatable. So how would you use this in practice? Well, in uh, thinking about the design, you'd need to provide methods to initialize and serialize and deserialize the heap. You'd need to provide methods to store and access something I call a master object that resides in the heap. On the source side, You'd need to ensure that the relocatable type requirements are observed by all the contents of the heap. You'd need to construct the master object in the heap at a known address in the relocatable heap. You would need to allocate the stuff that you want to be persisted from the heap and make sure that it's accessible via the master object. The master object is, in a sense, a table that points to all the interesting stuff in the heap, and that table exists at a known address inside the heap so that you can get to that table after you've deserialized it. So you serialize the heap and on the destination side you deserialize it and you get access to the heap's contents through the master object. Now this is all a lot of hand waving and ideas. So now I'd like to talk briefly about addressing and allocation. And this is, these concepts are really sort of the meat of the talk here. So, when I think about this problem, I think that there, I personally see six not quite orthogonal concepts, and here I mean concept with a lowercase c, split into two broad categories. The first category is that of structural management. And there are four, there are four, four concepts here under structural management that we'll, we'll cover in a moment. Uh, I call them concepts, but it's also perfectly reasonable to think about them as being policy types. <coughs> the second broad category I think of as being concurrency management, and here the, idea, the, the, the concepts of thread safety and transaction safety. So let, let's go through the concepts in detail. The first, which is very important, is that what I call the addressing model. This is a policy type that implements primitive addressing operations. Uh, in a way, it's analogous to a void pointer. It represents, in some way, an address in a process's address space. It's convertible to a void pointer. This is, an important, this is important because later, when we use this to point to real things, we need to be able to convert to void star to be able to convert to, to T star. The addressing model defines the bit pattern that's used to represent an address. It defines how an address is computed from that bit pattern. It also defines, in my conception here, how memory from something I call the storage model is arranged. And the storage model is, is, is on deck here. You know, there are really sort of two representations of the address model. One is an ordinary pointer, which is a void star. A void star fulfills my requirements for what makes something an addressing model. It represents an address, uh, it has a pattern of bits, and the compiler knows how to use that pattern of bits to compute an address. You don't have to do that yourself. And it is castable to a T star, so I can represent some real object with it. There is also the idea of a fancy void pointer, also known as a synthetic pointer or a pointer-like type. Now, you hear the term fancy pointer, 
synthetic pointer. I actually prefer the term synthetic pointer. It has one more syllable, so it's fancier than fancy. Uh, so if I say synthetic pointer or fancy pointer or pointer-like type, these are all interchangeable terms. So let's talk about the storage model. The storage model is a policy type that manages what I call segments. Some allocators call them super blocks. It interacts with some external source of memory to borrow segments and hopefully at some point return them to their owner. It provides an interface to those segments which it obtained from the, internal, the external source by using the addressing model. <coughs> it is the lowest level of, level of allocation in, in my mental model. It is usually closely coupled with the addressing model. The addressing model and the storage model work together in the, fact, in the, in the sense that the storage model gets segments and lays them out in memory in a way that the addressing model understands. The addressing model then uses its knowledge of the segments that are provided by the storage model to do addressing computations. So what is a segment? Well, as I said, it's a large region of memory that's been provided to the storage model object by some external source. And here's some examples. We've got break or sbreak, which is you know, the Unix private heap, or virtual alloc heap alloc, which can be used to create private heaps in Windows. We've got shmget and shmat for system 5 shared memory. We've got create file mapping and map view of file for Windows shared memory. So we have sources of private and shared memory which can provide large segments uh, to be managed by the storage model. The next important piece I, I call the pointer interface. This is a policy type that wraps the addressing model to emulate a pointer, a pointer to some real data. It's analogous to a T star and it provides enough pointer syntax for containers to function, specifically in this talk, the standard containers. It is convertible in the right direction to ordinary pointers. In other words, I can take a synthetic pointer of T and convert it to a T star or a T const star or a T const volatile star. I can add CV qualifiers to it and it works. It's convertible in the right direction to other pointer interface types. So if I have a sin pointer of T, I can make a sin pointer of T const star or, or a sin pointer of T const volatile. It extends the interface of random access iterator. <coughs> so what are the representations? Well, again, an ordinary T star fulfills these requirements. And a synthetic pointer, correctly constructed, will, is also capable of fulfilling these requirements. And we're going to see one such construction in this talk. The next important concept is that of the allocation strategy. The allocation strategy is a policy type that manages the process of allocating memory for its clients. It requests segment allocation and deallocation from the storage model. It interacts with segments in terms of the addressing model. And it divides the segments into chunks. And in my sophisticated terminology, a chunk is a smaller region of memory that's carved out of a segment. And these are the bits of memory that your applications actually use. Bryce. The term policy type here, is that a this is a bastardization of Andre Alexandrescu's concept of a policy type. So it provides chunks to the client in terms of the pointer interface. And you can think of this as being analogous to the, to the heap management strategies underneath malloc and free or global operator new or any of the other, uh, any other uh, custom allocators that you can find. The other concepts, which I'm only going to touch on briefly, are thread safety and transaction safety. Thread safety obviously means ensuring that your program operates correctly in the presence of multiple threads or processes, no data races. Transaction safety means allocating and deallocating chunks in a way that could be by, used by something that requires ACID semantics, like a shared memory database, uh, which means providing you know, commit and rollback. Uh, I think of this as the concurrency uh, the concurrency concepts have an, some influence on the structural concepts uh, and there really could be, the influence could be very uh, complex. We're only going to really talk about the structural concepts in this talk. Uh, 
Uh, can you see that? It's sort of cut off a little bit. So this is an example of an addressing model. And here, I'm in, a, I'm in some address space. I've got something which I call the backbone, which is an array of pointers to segments. <coughs> and I think of this as being a two-dimensional addressing model because in order to get to a byte in a segment, I sort of have to do a two-dimensional operation. I have to look up a segment pointer, and then I have to follow an offset into the segment pointer to get, uh, to get the bit of data. Uh, and typically, this would be, you know, I use a UN8 star pointer, an array of segments. So in a private address space, it could be laid out in this way. And all of this stuff exists inside a process's address space. I could have a shared memory <coughs> situation where I've allocated my segments in shared memory, and I've used one of the shared memory management functions to map them into my private address space so that I can actually uh, use data from them. I could use this, for example, in a shared memory database. And here, I've got two processes, P1 and P2. I've got private backbones in each one, and I've mapped the shared segments into the backbones. There's no guarantee that the segments will always be mapped to the same address in each, in each process space. So you can see that the addresses, the, these represent the addresses, are different in the two different processes. This can happen when you're working with shared memory. But these all point to the same set of segments, and inside the segment, I've tried to implement something that looks like a binary tree. This can be done. <coughs> Another addressing model is the offset addressing model, and Boost Inner Process was probably one of the first implementations of this several years ago. But what does it mean? Oh, sorry, Bryce. Um, on the previous slide, um, are these two separate processes? These are two separate processes, right? P1 yeah, P1 and P2. The same things are being mapped to two I different addresses. I don't care about mapping the same thing to two different addresses in the same process. That's correct. I do not. All right. Let's talk about offset addressing. Offset addressing is a little bit different in that the representation of the thing that a pointer points to is dependent on the address of the pointer itself. So here I have putter 1, putter 2, and putter 3. They all point to my string at address 44, but the internals of putter 1 and putter 2 and putter 3 are different. So they mean the same thing, but they actually have different set of bits that represent them. And here, the bits are actually represent the distance of the pointee from the pointer. So if you take 8 and 36, you get 44. 20 and 24, you get 44. 72 and minus 28, you get 44. <coughs> The thing that you point to uh, is, it, the, your representation of the thing that you point to is based on the distance of that thing from you. So how could you use this? You could create what I call a self-contained DOM. Suppose you have some document and you want to wrap it up in some kind of message. So here, uh, can't really see very well, but this bluish area represents some data structure that represents this binary tree. And this yellowish area to the right represents a heap. This all actually happens to be in the same linear set of bytes. And my allocator actually points to my buffer from which my allocations are performed. It would be nice if I could wrap this whole thing up and send it to somebody else at a different address. And they could get a pointer to it and use it immediately. <coughs> Any questions so far? Any quick questions? OK. A couple of notes on synthetic pointers. First, the standard calls them uh, pointer-like types. They are only mentioned four times in the standard. Uh, the only real substance occurs in table 28 uh, in that version of the draft. I haven't looked to see if the table number has changed in the latest version. And there are, it specifies requirements for nullable pointer. And there are several requirements that a nullable pointer has to, to, uh, to meet. I'm not going to enumerate them here. It has to have swappable L values. Uh, default initialization may result in un undefined behavior. Value initialization has to produce what it calls a null result or something that means the null pointer. Construction or assignment, construction from or assignment from a null pointer also has to produce a null result. The pointer-like type has to mean a null address. It 
should be contextually convertible to bool. And finally, certain fundamental operations which are listed in Table 28 may not throw exceptions. This is the standards take on, on, on pointer-like types. There's also a runtime cost. If you're going to implement your own synthetic pointer and the arithmetic, it's not going to be as fast as that of ordinary pointers because the compiler knows how to do that very quickly. There are also some limitations with regard to casting. The only real casting you can do is from static cast. Static cast is allowed to invoke and generate code. Const cast, dynamic cast, reinterpret cast, and C style casts are not. So let's look at some framework. Let's see if I'm on time here. Okay. All right. I'm going to sketch out a framework. There are several pieces to the framework. I'm only going to concentrate really on the addressing model and the synthetic pointer. The other types, I'm going to show you some, some class interfaces for and wave my hand and say it all works. This talk is about fancy pointers and with regard to fancy pointers, it's really the addressing model and the, and the, uh, the pointer interface types that are really relevant. So, what are the framework types? Well, I've got a storage model base class, which I call storage model base. I'm going to briefly cover five different addressing models, five different bit patterns that can be used to represent a pointer. I'm going to discuss uh, a class template called SynPutter, which can wrap any of those addressing models and provide pointer-like semantics and syntax. I'm going to gloss over an allocation strategy, which I call monotonic allocation strategy. Uh, and I'm going to briefly cover something I call the RHX allocator <coughs> for relocatable heap experiment allocator, which is parameterized in terms of a type T and a heap type. And that heap type will be the mono monotonic allocation strategy, which is parameterized in terms of the storage manager, the storage manager, is, uh, is going to be parameterized in terms of an addressing model, as well as the synthetic pointer. So there's some template interdependence amongst the pieces here. So let's look at the storage model base class. Consider this picture, uh, a simplification of the earlier two-dimensional addressing model that just has a couple of segments in it. I've got a backbone with pointers to my segments, and I've got another array that manages the sizes of those two segments. With that picture in mind, this is what the class, uh, the class declaration for this looks like. I've got some, some type defs, uh, some enumerations, and then I've got a set of member functions which manage the segments which I'm going to create and tie to the backbone. These functions are, uh, I've tried to bold this. I don't know if you can see the bolding very well. Uh, this function, swap segments, is going to play later, it'll be very important later in the presentation. You can tell from the names that these are functions that manage segments. They're not super important for this talk. There's also the function segment address, which is important for this talk. Uh, the others, not so much. And then finally, uh, there's the data. Uh, importantly, there's the backbone, the segment pointers. There's this thing called shadow pointers, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And then finally, importantly, is this function segment <coughs> address. And what segment address does is, given the index of a segment, it returns a pointer to the base of that segment. Bryce. Um, I'm a little confused. Well, why, why, why have this be uh, a base class with these static? Why not have this be used like a value base, this storage model base? Uh, I am glossing over that in this presentation because <coughs> the, the, the base type is, uh, there are actual the actual storage managers that used are template types, and those types are parameterized in terms of the addressing models. And this just serves as a common base for all those templates, so I don't have to, uh, I don't have to re-implement that. But, but, but why have like this sort of singleton? Uh, why, why not have these be value types, right? Like, why, why are why are all these members and all these methods static? Why, why? They're static intentionally <laughs> because this is intended to be a singleton. Okay. This is intended to be a singleton. The, uh, in the addressing models that work with this, they expect that this will be a singleton. Okay, so here's the real picture. I've got my, my backbone to my segments. I've got what I a shadow backbone to my shadow segments. And 
later on, the shadow segments will play an important part in a demonstration that I hope to give. So keep this picture in mind. All right, let's talk about addressing models. Well, the first addressing model is what I call a wrapper addressing model. And all the wrapper addressing model does is it wraps a T star, or actually it wraps a void star. So I'm going to show you the interface for the wrapper addressing model. All the other addressing models have a very similar interface, and what I hope to do in the subsequent ones is show you the differences in their internal representation. But it's very straightforward. I have a lot of defaulted special functions here. The ones that are in bold represent things that I've written code for, uh, you know, uh, construction from the null pointer, construction from a void star, assignment from a null pointer. I've got some, all, they all have helper functions, which, uh, you know, in my lazy way, uh, help later on uh, in, in, in writing comparison operations. Uh, there are sort of four key functions, address, assign from, increment, and decrement. And finally, there's the representation for this. And as you can tell from the name, the wrapper addressing <coughs> model is a wrapper for a void star. And it's there as a sanity check. Can we wrap a void star and have things work as if it were a void star. So the addressing, uh, the address function is trivial. I'm just going to return the address to a sign from a void star. It's trivial. Yes, Bryce? Ah, uh, this is, yes, sorry. This is an implementation. This is uh, actually for this reason. Sometimes I need to assign from a void const star. Okay, we can, we can discuss it offline. The question was why the union, and it's a tactical decision, uh, but I'm happy to explain it after the talk. So the, ad the address function, assign from functions are trivial. Uh, in terms of increment and decrementing, yes, you cannot increment and decrement void pointers. I realize that, but I'm cheating, and I'm, I'm allowing the, the addressing models, which represent void pointers, to do increment and decrement operations. <coughs> This is a tactical decision rather than some meaningful philosophical decision. Next, I'd like to talk about the two-dimensional addressing models, and I have three of them. They are variations on a theme. The address, like the, like the wrapper addressing model, they are parameterized in terms of the storage manager. Again, here's a picture of the storage manager, but here's the difference. To represent the pointer, I'm going to keep a, an index of the segment and the offset to the data in one of the segments so that in computing the, this is how I would compute the address. I would get the address of the, the base address of the segment and add the offset to it to get the data. So it's segment offset addressing just like 16-bit DOS. So let's look at the first one of these, the 2D extra large addressing model. Same idea, same interface. Uh, Slightly different constructor because I'm going to construct the ad this addressing model in terms of a segment ID and a, and a byte offset. Uh, same for important functions. But here's the important implementation detail. I'm going to keep a UNT64 that represents my offset index and a UNT64 which rep <coughs> my offset and a UNT64 which represents my segment ID. So, how do I use this? Well, you remember there was that function called segment address, which was part of the storage manager. I'm going to use that to get the address of the segment and add the offset to it and return it as a void star, right? Two-dimensional addressing. Sort of like the old numerical recipes in C, if anybody ever remembers uh, reading that book and implementing the multidimensional arrays from the end of the book. Uh, incrementing and decrementing is trivial. I add or subtract uh, the increment or the amount from the offset. Assign from is a little tricky, and I've included all the code here, but I don't expect everybody to read it. Assigning from <coughs> some arbitrary void star means iterating over all the segments and looking to see if the address exists inside that segment. If it does, I compute, I know what the segment index is, and I compute the offset, and I can return that. If it does not exist inside one of the segments, then I'm going to use segment zero. Segment zero had a null pointer. The value of the null pointer is zero, and my offset is just going to be uh, the, the address of the data itself. 
converted to an integer. So if I take uh, if I, my segment, segment 0, the base address of segment 0 is 0, and I add the offset to it, which is an integer representation of the address, I get back to the original data. The 2D small addressing model is identical, except for the fact that I'm using uint 32 ts to represent the offset in the segment. So now I've got, I'm back to an 8-byte pointer. Uh, computing the address is, is exactly the same as before, except that I'm using 4-byte integers instead of 8-byte integers. This is slightly different. This is the two-dimensional mask addressing model. Here, I'm going to use 8 bytes to represent the pointer, but I'm going to, I'm going to define the structure. It's got 64 bits in it, or four 2-byte words. I'm going to use the lower 48 bits to represent the offset, and I'm going to find them by using that mask. And I'm going to use the upper 16 bits to rep represent the segment index. I'm using this union here with the uint64 so I can initialize it to zero in one shot and represent the null pointer. And when I compute the address, it's very straightforward. I'm going to use uh, this uint16 <laughs> as the segment ID, and I'm going to take my, uh, my offset mask, and I'm going to mask it with this entire value and use that to compute the offset into a segment. Does that make sense? So I've got one 16-byte pointer. I've got two 8-byte pointers. They all work in a very similar way, but they have different internal bits to work in that way. Finally, the offset addressing model. Again, the offset addressing picture. The address of my point T is equal to converting the address of, of me to a char star and adding the offset, which I store internally, to get to the point T. So the precondition, or the postcondition, I, I, I suppose, is that if I dereference putter 1 and putter 2 and I take the address of those things, the real address of those things should be the same. But if I do a mem compare of putter 1 and putter 2, their internal bits are going to be different. So I have two pointers that mean the same thing but have different internal state. The offset addressing model, what's different about it is the only defaulted thing is the destructor. All the special functions have to actually have code behind them. They need to be implemented because I need to be able to compute offsets. I'm not going to go into the constructors or, um, or assignment operators. I am going to talk about these functions and the internal representation. So I'm, I'm using uh, st standard uh, std putter diff t as my difference type. And here I'm just using the diff type, type def to uh, make the code a little more readable. And internally, I'm just storing an offset. And I have some helper functions. I have a static helper function, which, com uh, which computes the distance between a and b. I also have a couple of helper functions that allow me to compute the distance between some other thing and this object. So let's look at the helper functions first. They're quite straightforward. Offset between two things. Here I was experimenting with int putter t. And so to compute the offset between from and to, I subtract the integer representation the of, the, of the address to from the integer representation of the address from. That gives me a standard putter diff t, and I store that as my, I store that as my offset. To compute my <laughs> offset to something else from me, that's a static function. These are ordinary member functions. What I look to do is see, in my, in, is the other guy, does the other guy represent, uh, is his offset the null offset? The, the null offset in the other guy represents the null pointer. If so, I will set myself to the null offset and I will represent a null pointer. Otherwise, I need to compute the offset between me and the other guy and I need to add his offset so that I get the distance from me to the thing that he points to. So, the distance from A to B plus the distance from B to X. That gives me the distance from A to X. And similarly for dealing with uh, uh, a void star, a, a natural address to something else. So, how do I compute the address of something? Well, 
If my offset is the null offset, I'm going to return a null pointer. Otherwise, I'm going to reinterpret cast me into a uint putter of t. I'm going to add the offset to me, and then I'm going to reinterpret cast myself back to a void star. And this is a very similar approach to what boost inner process takes in its offset putter. I'm not sure that you actually need to use the reinterpret cast and the int putter t and uint putter t, but I did for the purposes of this presentation. Yes, Jonathan. The null offset is one, right? Yes. That's an important point. Um, yes. Why one? Okay. The null offset is one. That's a very strange thing for the null offset to be. Why isn't the null offset zero? Well, these guys in a 64-bit in a process are eight bytes wide. Imagine that you have two of these things that represent a node in a doubly linked list, and the list is empty, and it's a sentinel node. So my prev pointer and my next pointer and my sentinel node need to point to me. Well, the offset, if I'm a pointer and I need to point to myself, the offset is zero. So I can't use zero as an offset because that's a legal offset. So I need to use something else. So uh, boost inner process putter, uh, offset putter, uses the value one, and I think it makes sense. It represents an, ad, an offset of one byte into me, an eight byte pointer. Well, that doesn't make any sense, because if you want my address, you have to address, you need to take the address of the, my lowest byte, not one byte into me. So an offset of one, actually an offset of any number less than my size of, is an invalid offset. So I choose one to represent the null offset. Make sense? Okay. Uh, all right, so we know how to assign from by computing the address to it. Uh, incrementing and decrementing are just changing the offset. And let's see. So in my constructors, uh, my <coughs> value constructor, I construct myself with a null offset. For my move and copy constructors, I compute the offset to my source. Uh, same thing with the assignment operators. Okay. The pointer interface. This is probably the most complex part of the show here. So here's an outline of what this class <laughs> looks like. We're going to talk about special member functions, other constructors, assignment other assignment operators, conversion operators, dereferencing and pointer arithmetic, uh, some helper functions that I'll gloss over to support uh, actually, the, the helpers to support standard library requirements and helpers for comparison operators, uh, which I'm not going to say much about. And finally, the private member data that's used to, to uh, implement the synthetic pointer. Before we do that, I want to talk about some helper traits to assist me with Sphene in the class interface. The first set of traits are for enabling if... I want to, this has to, to do with performing conversions. So I have two logical inverses. I use these traits to recognize if a, a, a T star or a from star is convertible to a, a two star, or if a from star is not convertible to a two star. And I want to be able to enable or disable certain member functions depending on whether or not that pointer convertibility holds. Uh, this trait enable if comparable to t. This is a trait that I use to turn comparison operation on and off so that I'm not comparing a string star, uh, uh, I'm not comparing a string star to a sin putter of double, right? That comparison doesn't make any sense. So this trait I use in, with Sphene to only enable comparisons operations that make sense. Uh, enable if non-void t. This is, a, this is a trait that I use with Sphene to enable uh, pointer operations for things that are not void. We'll see an example of that in a moment, like dereferencing. You can't dereference a void pointer, so this trait uh, takes the dereference operator out of the overload resolution set. And finally, this is just a helper trait that allows me to determine whether T is void or not uh, in the class. Okay, so let's start at the top. I've got some type defs. Uh, Notice that I provided a rebinder. This is required by stood pointer traits uh, for use with uh, allocator-aware containers. Uh, 
I'm going to define some other aliases, aliases here. So my sin putter is parameterized in terms of my point T, uh, of my type T, and my addressing model. And from my addressing model, I'm going to grab its difference type, I'm going to grab its size type, I'm going to grab its element type and value type, which are synonymous here. In terms of reference, this is why I had this type here. I wanted to determine whether or not T was uh, void or if it was non-void. If, if it was any CV qualified void type, then the reference type def is void. If it's anything other than a CV qualified uh, type of void, then it, it's actually T ref. And finally, pointer, uh, I'm just basically type defing to myself. I'm also defining an iterator category here so this thing can be used as a random access iterator. The special member functions are easy. They're all defaulted. My user-defined constructors, a little bit different here. Here, I'm allowing implicit conversion from an addressing model object, an implicit conversion from a null putter T. Here, I'm allowing an implicit conversion if T star is con uh, if u star is convertible to a t star. So if my type t is base and my type u is derived, then a derived star is implicitly convertible to a base star. So here I'm using the type trait with Sphene to enable this conversion constructor if the trait is true. And I'm doing the same thing here for not only for natural pointers, but the same thing with other sin putters. And I want to do the same thing with user-defined assignment. I want to do something quick and dirty or quick with when I'm assigning from a null putter T. And again, I want to enable these assignment operators if I can implicitly convert from a U star to a T star. In terms of conversion operators, again, sort of the same story. I, I made this explicit, but it will be contextually, uh, con it will still enable contextual implicit conversions to bool in if and while and for statements. Here I want to allow an implicit conversion to u star if a t star can be converted to a u star. Just like a derived uh, type of derived star is implicitly convertible to a base star. However, if T star is not convertible to U star, then I want to make this conversion operator explicit and require a static cast for that to occur. And same principle applies for doing a static cast to a sin putter of U. Now, as pointer type, I need to be able to do stru structure dereferencing. I need to dereference the pointer its type itself. I also need to do indexing. So, Again, here's where I'm using the enable if non-void. So if my type T is non-void, my type T is non-void, the trait will, will evaluate to true, and these uh, member operators will appear in the overload resolution set. If type, if type T is any CV qualified void, it's as if these guys don't exist. And uh, similar principles apply for the other uh, pointer or random access iterator operators. They appear if type T is not a CV qualified void type. I'm going to go through them very quickly. It, sorry, this is the same operators that a random access iterator has. Uh, this function, pointer2, uh, is required by, pointer, by stood pointer traits of T, so I've, I've implemented it here. And again, like the other function, it only appears if T is not a CV qualified void type. These are some of the comparison helpers I told you about. I'm not going to talk about them. In the base, in the bottom of the class in my implementation, here's an instance of my addressing model. This is the bits that represent the address. And all of this template machinery is going to, is going to, is a wrapper to that. So I'm just going to look at a couple interesting functions. Uh, conversion. Yes, casting. So in the case of casting to a U star, uh, implicit casting in this case, uh, I'm going to take my, my address model object, I'm going to compute an address, and I'm just going to static cast it to U star. 
I'm going to do the same thing when explicit conversion is required, and I'm going to rely on the compiler and the inner workings of Sphene to make the correct version appear depending on what the type of T is and the relationship between T and V. And this enables uh, conversion uh, casting to pointer types to be implicit when it makes sense and to require explicit casting like when you're doing upcasting. And here are functions for doing a similar thing for doing structure dereferencing <coughs> with the arrow operator or pointer dereferencing with the star operator. Okay, so with all of this I've implemented a class template that has an interface that mocks or emulates an ordinary pointer as far as it can be done. Some clever person could probably make it a little closer, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, the next piece in the framework, quickly, is the monotonic allocation strategy that I talked about. I'm not going to go into any detail of any of the functions, but I am going to point out that this, the allocation strategy uses the storage model to get an addressing model, and from the addressing model, it determines a void pointer type, and it also provides a rebinder for its clients, and it has functions for allocating and deallocating mem memory and managing the buffers. The allocator part of the framework, RHX allocator, is a standard conforming allocator. It will work with standard containers. In fact, last year I gave a talk which used most of this framework to look at uh, the conformance of Visual, uh, Visual Studio, Clang, and GCC at the time, and how closely their container libraries uh, conform to the requirements for allocator-aware containers. Yes, Bryce. Yes, that's correct. Uh, this may be required by stood allocator traits. Not sure. All right. So the important thing here, uh, can ignore the, the propagation stuff. I'm not going to talk about that. Here's the important thing. I'm now using my HT or heap type, which is the monotonic allocation strategy. And from that, I'm going to get its void pointer representation. I'm going to get its const void pointer representation. And I'm going to use the rebinder that it provides to rebind type T into a pointer that points to a T. And I'm also going to rebind, use its rebinder to create a const pointer to T. Right? So this will work with natural pointers. It will work with sin putter and it will end up with having typed pointer and const pointer types that, that, that are not void that actually can be dereferenced to point to, uh, to refer to something of type T. And uh, in conformance with what the standard expects, there are allocate and deallocate functions. Uh, here's an instance of my heap which I'm storing privately. And I'm just going to quickly show allocate and deallocate. If you recall, the addressing strategy, my heap, <coughs> allocates a buffer of bytes and returns it as a void pointer, whatever that void pointer type is. And here, I'm using the static casting mechanism that I've built into SINPUTTER to turn it to a typed pointer and returning it. And I'm sort of doing the opposite thing with deallocate. This machinery will work with natural pointers or SINPUTTER. Any questions? Okay. I'd like to very quickly take a detour into how fast these synthetic pointer types are. Uh, to do this, I've defined this egregiously large thing I call test struct. It's 128 bytes long. It's got a couple of integers in it. It's got a bunch of bytes. Its copy semantics are basically everything gets copied uh, with memcopy. Uh, uh, because it, it, it is a standard layout type, uh, move semantics and copy semantics are the same operations, or require the same amount of time. I'm going to run a set of, on each, um, each of those uh, addressing models, uh, I've got some stuff behind the scenes here that I call strategies, uh, but basically for each of those addressing <coughs> models, I'm going to test its speed for uint 64s and for this test struct, and I'm going to run test with a, a customized version of, of copy and I'm also going to run 
test, speed test with stood sort. So there are five addressing models, which we've just covered. There are the two data types, UNT 64T and test struct. There are 13 array sizes, uh, 100, 200, 500. The pattern repeats up to 1 million elements. Two algorithms that I'm going to test, a customized version of std copy and std sort. And I ran the test with three compilers. The shape of the graphs and the results are very similar among the three compilers. I'm only going to show in this talk the results with GCC. Uh, this is the hardware that it was running on uh, for the Clang and, and uh, GCC compilations, all on the same machine, a Windows 10 machine. All tests were performed in a single thread and used stood chrono to do the timing. <coughs> copy operations for the copy tests were repeated for a million, uh, 10 million copies, so the, the 10 million element buffer the copy was done 10 times, the 100,000 element buffer, the copy was done 100 times, and so on and so forth. The sorts were performed 10 to 100 times depending on the array size. Smaller arrays were, so were sorted more times. Uh, most importantly, GCC and Clang both used lib std C++ from the standard library facilities so that they were using exactly the same sorting algorithm. The results I'm going to show you are ratios the time it took for this operation for a synthetic pointer over the time it took for an, an ordinary pointer. The perfect case would be this ratio is 1. And you'll see for some pointer implementations the ratio approaches 1. For some pointer operations the ratio is far from 1. Alright, so let's look at copy with uint 64 t And this is a copy that is a copy a version of copy that is, is intentionally de-optimized. I, I wrote it in such a way that the compiler doesn't look at it and say, oh, I'm just going to mem copy things, because I actually wanted to compare the cost using natural pointers of doing an old school manual copy from one 8-bit uh, integer to another versus the same cost with a synthetic pointer. Bryce. Uh, what's the statistical uncertainty in these numbers here? Like what, what's these lines at the bottom here jumping around a bit? Um, I'd like, love to see this with like error bars. Do you know um, what the sample standard deviation was? No, I, 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 didn't, I didn't compute those numbers. I can say that having run the numbers, having run the tests many, many times, uh, the standard deviation is relatively small. Okay. But I didn't actually provide the error bars here. I think that would have been a little bit noisy on this graph and for a future day. So, we would expect that the performance for this for some pointers would be pretty bad. Uh, we can see that for the wrapper and the based 2D extra large and based 2D small pointers, our ratio is pretty close to 1. And I think this variation around 1 here is really just noise. Uh, now for the based 2D mask pointer, I have no explanation for this crazy behavior here for small number of elements, but I can tell you that this odd behavior is common across all three compilers. Uh, I'm not showing the other two sets of graphs here, but they are in the sets of slides that are, that are in the PDF that I've published on my GitHub. So you can look at those if you're interested. We would expect with all the pointer arithmetic, that the, all the arithmetic that the offset pointer does, that there is actually going to be some tangible cost. And we can see that it varies here from about 5% to as much as almost 10% here at 50,000 elements. Uh, so, now the same copy, copy operation for copying our test struct. Well, now we would hope to see the cost of pointer operations be buried in the cost of doing the copy of the test struct itself, which is very large. And we can sort of see that behavior. If with small array size, yes, the time is spread out, but it doesn't take very long to where everybody sort of converges around one. And that's because the cost of copying or moving one of those very large structures overwhelms the cost of the pointer operations. So, uh, interesting. <coughs> Let's look at sorting uint 64 ts This is probably the most difficult test. Stood sort does all kinds of arithmetic on the iterators inside the, inside the algorithm. And the iterators in this case were, the, were uh, the natural pointers or the synthetic pointers. So we see sort of nice behavior here in terms of somewhat smooth curves for the different 
uh, types of sorts. And as we would expect, offset sort is the most expensive. Uh, the masking sort is the second most expensive because of those extra bit masking operations for computing the address. And finally, the, t the simple 2D operations and the <coughs> wrapper type all sort of converge nicely around one. Although the 2D small, I can't explain why it is slightly slower than the 2D large. And finally, for the test struct, again, you sort of hope that things get buried in the cost of, of, of swapping the test struct around. We see a similar behavior here, but this is something which is very strange and I can't really explain it. And using the wrapper addressing model is actually faster than using natural pointers. And this is repeatable across compilers and across runs. I don't have any explanation for it. It's very strange. So, take away. Offset pointers usually have the worst performance. Otherwise, it's difficult to predict which, offs which addressing model will have the best performance. And there's a surprising variation across data types and array sizes. Okay, 24 minutes left or so. so I'd like to do a couple demos, starting with a demo of 2D relocation. So, recall back to the picture of my, two, my original storage manager. I've got my two-dimensional layout of memory of segments and shadow segments. And I'm just <coughs> repeating the slide here. And I talked before about this function called swap segments. And what swap segments does is it, it walks along the, array, the backbone array and for every legitimate segment it mem copies the data of a segment into the shadow segment and then it swaps the pointers between the shadow backbone and the ordinary backbone so that, my, shadow, that my, my backbone is pointing to the shadow segments and the shadow backbone is pointing to the old segments. I'm basically mem copying data into a bunch of buffers and swapping the buffers. And why am I doing that? Well, clearly, these two guys exist at different addresses. And now I want to use this thing and pretend that it's this old thing. So here's a going to show you uh, a test function that, that tests relocatability using uh, fancy pointers. So first, because we're using templates and, and things can get very long, I'm going to walk through some, some tight defs. So as a note, uh, std string is not an allocator aware container. I couldn't use it for this. So I created something I call simple string, which which emulates a portion of the, of the std string interface, but which is allocator aware. So when you see simple string here, think, yes, std string in the future when it becomes allocator aware. So I've got a string type, which, param which in, for my string, I just parameterize it in terms of the allocator. I'm going to create a, a, a synthetic. I, I prefixed all of these things with sin just to say that they are based using synthetic pointers. So I'm going to create a list of my synthetic string, and here I'm going to specify the allocator as being my, uh, my RHX allocator of string of my strategy type, and my strategy type is something that represents my addressing model. I'm going to define st std less, or a type def for std less in terms of st std string, a pair, and an allocator with the obvious conclusion that I want to create a map. So I'm going to create a map of string to list of strings. Except, I'm going to do this with synthetic pointers using my, my uh, storage <coughs> model. All right. So, in actually loading up the map, I'm going to use this helper function. I'm not going to show you here, but helper function is a function which uses the RHX allocator and just saves a lot of ugly syntax. To allocate an empty map in my heap, and I'm going to allocate a couple of helper strings also in the heap. I'm going to walk over some loop. I'm going to create a key string and I'm, I'm using sprintf here because I'll do anything to avoid using the IO streams. Uh, I'm going to uh, create a key string. I'm also going to, I'm going to uh, create a list. Uh, actually, I'm going to create a, I'm going to create a value string and then I'm going to use the key to insert the value string into my map. So I'm dereferencing my map pointer, I'm dereferencing my key string, right? Just, and which is the indexing operator from a map. 
and then that returns a reference to my list, and I'm going to add my string into that list. I've created a map of string to list of string using synthetic pointers in my relocatable <coughs> heap. Then I'm going to swap the segments. I'm going to take all of that data that exists in my original segments, I'm going to mem copy it into the shadow segments, I'm going to swap them, and then I'm going to see, can I print the map again? I should be able to do that. So, with any luck, okay. All right, so this is an Ubuntu 1804 virtual machine running on my laptop here. On the right, I've got GDB open, uh, and this is an executable compiled with Clang. On the left, I've, I've got a, uh, a, re a regular console, and I'm going to redirect output from the GDB session into uh, the terminal that you see on the left. So, all right. Okay, so I'm going to step into this test function. All right, so as you can see on the right, uh, going through the code that I just showed you, I'm going to allocate the map in my heap. Whoops. I'm going to allocate a key string and a value string. <coughs> I'm going to create data to put into it. I'm going to insert it into the map. There I'm inserting my list, my five elements into the list. And I'm going to keep doing this until the map gets filled up. Now I'm going to print the contents of that map. I'm not going to show you print map, but you can imagine what it is. It's just a simple function that uses the map interface. Here's the contents of the map. Here I'm using the 2D extra large strategy. And uh, I can't see everything, but at the end of each row here, what I've printed is the actual physical address of this thing in the process's address space. This is the, the, this is the address of where these things lie inside one of those heap segments, right? Now I'm going to swap the segments. So I'm going to mem copy from the primary segment into the shadow segments, swap the pointers in the backbone. And now I'm going to print the map again. I've got the same contents, exactly the same contents, a map, of string, of list of strings. Look at the addresses. They're all different. The maps exist at different addresses. Each string exists at a different address from its corresponding string. This was the original source objects. These are the destination objects. The destination objects are semantically identical to the source objects after a relocation. Any questions? So this is the principle. The framework that's used here could be used as the basis for creating a shared memory database. And in fact, I can tell you from experience that there is a company out there that manages a key piece of internet structure that uses these same principles, not this code, not these names, not these classes but the same underlying principles to create an important piece of internet infrastructure that works very much like this. And every internet-enabled device in the world probably relies on it. So when I hear people say that fancy pointers are useless or these techniques uh, aren't good for anything, I can categorically say that that is not true. Okay. Oops.
All right, so moving on. So I talked about the two-dimensional addressing model, but there's another interesting thing, which is a self-contained DOM demo, wrapping everything up inside a message, and I can send it somewhere. So what would that look like? Well, now I'm going to go into a little detail of the components. All of them are very simple. Here I'm going to create this thing called self-contained DOM raw heap. And this thing just contains a buffer in it and a high water mark so I can do monotonic allocation from it. Yesterday at Arthur's talk, he said, this is bad. I disagree with him. It may be bad, but it feels very good because it works. <laughs> All right? And allocation is trivial. I'm, I'm just going to allocate data from it. I'm not going to manage that data because I'm trying to prove a point. So whatever my high water mark is, I'm going to create a pointer that represents that high water mark. And then I'm going to round up my high water mark up to the size of the allocation, round it up to eight for my next, for my next allocation. And I'm going to return a pointer based on, on my previous high water mark. Very simple, very trivial, monotonic allocation. Deallocation is a no-op in this implementation because I don't care about that. Now I'm going to create a different allocator that doesn't have quite as much machinery around it with the self-contained DOM allocator. This is a standard conforming container. So here I'm going to use my, my uh, self-contained DOM raw heap as my buffer for allocation. All of my traditional type defs that an allocator requires. Here, instead of using an addressing model and a storage model directly, I'm just, I know what they are. I'm just going to define them directly in terms of sin putter. Sin putter avoid, void const, t and t const, and uh, the other usual suspects. Here I'm providing a rebinder because the standard requires it. Like the, the, the interface for like all standard conforming allocators, there are lots of common pieces. Here's the interesting constructor. I'm going to take a pointer to the raw heap, uh, a, a pointer to my heap object when I construct my allocator. Inside my allocator, I'm going to store a pointer to the raw heap. Now, I agree with Arthur that allocators should be handles to memory resources. In this case, my synthetic pointer which is an offset pointer, which points to my raw heap somewhere, is a handle type, and it, it points to that memory resource. So here's the class that's actually going to use this stuff. I call it SCD message, self-contained DOM message. Very simple. I'm going to define the heap type. And as before, I'm going to create the same data structure as before. So I'm going to define a string type in terms of my allocator. I'm going to define a list type, which is parameterized in terms of my string type and the corresponding allocator for it. And I'm going to do the same business with the map. And here I'm using all these type defs so that my map template definition is not you know, six lines long. The SCD message is very simple. It contains the heap type, and it contains the map. The map is the DOM, and the heap is the buffer. I have a member function, which I'm going to use to add data to it, and I have a print function, which I'm going to use to print the data that exists in it. My add data function is pretty straightforward. I'm actually going to instantiate my string and list allocators. I'm going to use my string and list allocators as arguments when I instantiate my strings and my list. And these are temporary, these are working variables. I'm then going to do sort of the same kind of looping where I create a value string. I'm going to push it to the back of my list. I'm going to do this a few times. Then I'm going to create a key string. And then finally, I'm going to do an in-place insert of my key string and my list. And this will represent the, the, the uh, insertion of one piece of data. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, now I have a function, which I'm going to run in the demo here. And I'm going to violate all kinds of norms and, and sense of decency when I do so. 
Okay, so there's my test function. I'm going to step into that guy. All right, so I'm going to instantiate my message type. I'm going to use a buffer of 8192 bytes, one of my favorite numbers. And for giggles, let's just step into add data one time. So, oops, I didn't mean to step into that. So I've created my string allocator, my list allocator, my working strings, my working list. I'm going to <coughs> create some strings and push them to the back of the list. I'm going to create a key string, assign some value to it. I'm going to in place insert that into my map. And I'm done. And I'm going to do that a few more times. Now I'm going to print the contents of that, uh, of that message. So same idea, key string, and which is a key to several, a list of several other strings. And notice the addresses. Now, if you turn your attention to the right, I'm going to do something horrible. I'm going to violate all norms of contemporary decency. I've got an array of bytes, and I'm going to take my message object, and I'm going to mem copy it into that array of bytes. And even worse, I'm going to use reinterpret cast, and I'm going to get the address of the first byte in that buffer, and I'm going to pretend that it is a message type. Now I'm going to try and print it out. There you go. Notice the addresses. They are different. But wait, there's more. I'm going to do the same trick, except I'm going to use a std vector, because now I'm going to copy into memory that's on the heap. Shouldn't make any difference. Let's hope that it doesn't, otherwise I'll be greatly embarrassed. Uh, my <coughs> decency violating mem copy, my ugly cast, and I'm going to print the values again. Notice the addresses. Clearly, very high ad addresses on the stack, very low addresses clearly on the heap. My source objects, or my my destination objects are semantically identical to my source objects, but they exist in different addresses. This is the power of relocatable heaps. Why is this useful? Why do you care? Right now, I'm working in the field of distributed stream processing, and we spend, we waste an awful lot of CPU cycles taking data structures and serializing them into JSON so we can send them somewhere else and waste an equal or greater number of cycles deserializing them from JSON. Why do I need to do that? Especially because when I serialize them or deserialize them, when I deserialize them, usually I only need to read one thing out of them. Why waste all that time in rapid JSON? Why not have an object type which is a legitimate C++ fully constructed object, but which is also a pre-serialized bag of bytes that you can move around at will? When I did this, these operations are no different than taking the address of my message type and the length and using send to send this out over a socket and using receive on the other end to read that data into a buffer from a socket on the other side. And I could do that, grab a pointer to it, and use it immediately. No JSON anywhere in the picture. Okay. Enough pontificating on that. <coughs> In closing, if it comes back, not everybody needs them. You know, not everybody is an army ranger jumping out of airplanes. And so, synthetic pointers and relocatable heaps, not here's. Hmm. My cat must have been working, dancing on the keyboard. Synthetic pointers and relocatable heaps are a lot like parachutes. You don't need them very often, but when you do, they can be a lifesaver. They can help you solve problems you couldn't otherwise solve.
And, you know, so what are some possible applications? Well, you could re create a relocatable heap for private use. You could, for example, create a, a, a relocatable heap that contains some sort of saved game state and save that to a disk. And then perhaps read that back into a private relocatable heap inside your game to get access to that game state without any sort of uh, intermediate serialization. I'm not in the games industry. I don't know if that's a useful use case, but it seems like it might be. I could use a relocatable heap for shared memory to create a shared memory database. And as I said, there is one internet infrastructure company that does something like this. You could use it to create self-contained messages and, and DOMs and send them around to other people so they don't need to use intermediate formats. And, you know, you could also use this, uh, the synthetic pointer machinery, and if you wanted to create sort of a fancy or sophisticated allocator to instrument your allocations at a very fine-grained level. So, in closing, uh, this is a work in progress, so please stay tuned. I make a little bit of progress every year. Uh, the talk, the source code for this talk and PDFs of the slide, which include all the graphs, are up on my GitHub site right now. I put them up there just before the talk. And here's a shame, shameless plug for my blog. Uh, any questions? <coughs> Bryce. Um, so, fancy references uh, seem like they sort of go hand in hand with fancy pointers. Um, but we don't really have a way to write them today without something like operator dot. Correct. Or transparent uh, references. So, what one place where you really need this um, uh, uh, is when you've got, you want to have a fancy pointer to a remote object or something where a it's not in your memory space or just a regular um, C language reference will not work. Yes. Um, I think for all the use cases you um, illustrated, uh, this is not so much a problem, but um, you could still uh, engineer cases where you could get a reference from reference to one of your pointers, and then if you take redress of that, you're going to end up with not a fancy pointer. Um, that you, you, you would really even in the case where you don't really need fancy pointer or fancy references for functionality, um, you still sort of need them to protect yourself from uh, from losing that inf from losing the fancy pointer information, um, and giving people a way to like escape uh, out and get just a raw pointer to the thing. Um, okay. So I don't know. Have you have you um, had any experience working with fancy reference types? And no, you know, in the absence of any concrete implementation of, of the operator dot proposal and trying to create <coughs> fancy references, I haven't done any work in that regard. I think uh, in a larger sense, though, what you're referring to is what in Arthur's talk yesterday, he and I re re refer to as extended range pointers. Pointers whose representation can refer to things that exist actually outside the physical address space of a machine, like some remote resource. Um, One can imagine a situation where you have an extended range pointer and the dereferencing of that pointer invokes some RPC magic or somehow retrieves that thing which exists outside the address space, brings it into the address space, and then can return a, 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 a pointer to it. I, is that the point you're trying to make? To a degree, yes. I, I think that the model that you want to have for extended pointers is not necessarily one of remote. You, you may not want to have a model of... R remote is an application of that. Um, uh, you, you may, uh, what I'm saying is you may want to think of, if you have extended pointers or pointers to you know, potentially remote objects, in, um, in context of ISO C++, you might want to think about those as just sort of extending the scope and space of the abstract machine. Um, so that you can incorporate them into the execution model and the memory model. But, but yeah, that, that is sort of what I was getting at. Um, and and in one other kind, you can build smart reference types today. It's just that um, they tend to be very hacky um, because you, without operator dot, you can't, you can't make them truly transparent. Right. So, so the comment is, is that, number one, you could create smart reference types or things that are close to smart reference types today, but the implementations are non-optimal. And also, there are potentially useful applications for extended range pointers that refer to things outside of the possible physical address space of a machine. Right, okay.
I saw a question over there. Yeah. Right. You know, wire shark or something, trying to figure out a problem. So there still is a place, but you know, um, is there some kind of flexibility that you could you could put into the, the model system that you know, if I want to do you know a debugging test to try to track down a, a distributed problem, that I could output JSON, or maybe just some kind of provision like you could put a plugin on wire shark to interpret interpret in the, the binary packet in, back into JSON for you, something like that. Yeah. So. The, the, the question has to deal with the fact that the, the representation, the intermediate format in this case, is, is raw binary and it's hard to understand what that is if you're trying to debug a problem, especially with things like Wireshark. And have I thought about ameliorating that problem? And uh, the answer is no, I've not thought about it. But one can certainly imagine a situation where you're writing a distributed system and you, you uh, create or, or, or create an accounting for the fact that you may want to be able to switch the transmission of your data from a human readable format like JSON to a binary format like this. Presumably when you're trying to debug that problem you're looking at transport problems rather than data content problems and switching to a human readable content could help you debug the transport problem. <coughs> am, am I Expressing what you expressed? Well, sometimes it was a data problem, too. Okay. <laughs> All right. But, but I like the fact that you agree with my pontific pontification, so that makes you okay in my book. When we would switch to JSON, I mean, it would just almost die. Right. All right. Uh, Charlie. So, so the, uh, uh, well, so there are two answers to that. Uh, the first answer is for the self-contained DOM example that I showed you, all of that source code is in two or three hundred lines of code in one file, and it's all templates. So there's no reason why it could not be in a header. I just happen to have it in a CPP file for purposes of this demonstration. That is a fairly straightforward thing to do. In terms of the two-dimensional model and the two-dimensional heap, that could also be parameterized and exist in headers. Uh, it gets a little messier when you do that, but not inordinately messy. Uh, but there's no reason why it can't be done. And here, those things, uh, the, the storage model, uh, in the case for this talk, was deliberately non-template just to keep it easier to read on the screen. But the short answer is, there's no reason why those things cannot be header only. Yes? So, uh, how, how much are you actually using uh, shared memory so that the same objects are basically operating in different address spaces at the same time? I personally am not using it at all. A former company that I worked at uses it as the basis of their business. You make a valid point, but I cannot speak to it. Okay, uh, any more questions? Yes? Um, this might be my ignorance speaking, but do you know of any operating systems that have like a virtualized address space that could facilitate swapping messages back and forth on different machines? So the question is, do I know of any OSs that support a virtualized address space that could support something like this natively or close to natively? And I have a very short answer for you. No, I don't. But I'm not an OS guy. That's not in my ballywick. There very well could be something like that, but I don't know about it. Yes? I don't have a question but more comment. I really enjoy the way that you use your using statements to just break up all of those declarations into much more readable code. You're inviting me to pontificate some more yes. <laughs> on the topic of readability, yes. which 
in my book, is probably the most important cost-saving mechanism in software engineering. And 99.999% of companies and software engineers don't think about it. And I think that's a shame because it costs companies a ton of dough. So, all right, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you found it useful.